venturing out. <laughs> These are interesting times. I know you'll be captivated by uh, our, our speaker. So I'd like to do something a little different this evening. Is there anyone here who doesn't know Earl Smith? <laughs> All right. Obviously, no introduction is needed. <laughs> Uh, we're looking forward to your talk on inventions in water. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for braving the whatever is going on in this world. <laughs> but it's nice to come together with friends uh, and, and maybe change our minds a little bit about the world. Uh, but I, 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 this is really new for me, but you can watch and see how I do this. There you go. <laughs> We're going to talk about inventions. Probably <coughs> the first person who comes to mind for Americans when we talk about invention is uh, Thomas Edison. And there's Thomas Edison. I, I think I stole that image, so I won't leave it up there very long. Uh, Edison once said that all you have to do to invent something is to have an imagination and a pile of junk. And uh, <laughs> In Maine, as you know, we have lots of imagination and creativity, and as you drive around the countryside, you see we have piles of junk. So it's no great surprise that Waterloo was sort of a hotbed for the creative things that came out in the, in the second industrial revolution. And I'm going to zero in on some of those inventions, and, and by the way, uh, this is not limited to Waterloo. Uh, it would be a, it would be a fine talk, I think, but it doesn't have to be limited to Waterloo. Uh, it, it does. It, it would make sense to me if we just sort of set the scene. None of us today can remember what Waterloo was like uh, uh, leading up to the First World War or after the turn of the last century. Uh, in fact, from the period of the end of the Civil War until the mid-20th century, essentially the second industrial revolution, water power, steam power, the beginning of electricity. Um, and I had a sense when I began to write the water industry, um, how, just how magnificent this city was in that period, but I really didn't know the half of it. Um, and if you wonder where, how has it happened that Waterloo was blessed, uh, everything was lined perfectly. Uh, we were perched on the mighty Kennebec River, had thriving factories, mass production, assembly lines, new roads, electric lights, first automobiles, faster trains. Uh, a snapshot of Waterloo 1902 uh, would be the 100th anniversary of its incorporation as a town, 1902. It was at the time Maine's fastest growing city. It was called by the Chamber of Commerce, the Maine Chamber of Commerce, the most beautiful city in all of Maine. Um, let, let me show you that's, uh, that's taken in the summer of 1902 on the day that the City Opera House and, and City Hall was dedicated. Uh, and and I, I just love, I love the picture. I just love that picture. What a magnificent thing. What an interesting thing that the city would build uh, the center of its government together with the theater. It's just a wonderful thought reflects in large measure the kind of place that Waterloo was and is with its association with the colleges. Um, but there we go. Opera House lunch. Great, great picture. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, 6,000 people worked along the river in a half a dozen mills. And that's not to mention the Mesolonsky Stream where there were more than 20 factories along the Mesolonsky as it falls from Snow Pond to, to the Kennebec. Um, the, 
Elmwood Hotel. Isn't that magnificent? Some of us do remember the Elmwood Hotel. <laughs> Uh, we had lots of public buildings that you know, too. City Hall, uh, Opera House, uh, the library, the post office was being built, a new high school, uh, Gilman Street. Uh, and then Main Street, about the same period, with the trolley cars. Um, there were at least two or three shops of every kind on Main Street, uh, a dozen hotels, 20 restaurants, and by my own careful count, 23 bars. <laughs> <laughs> and two-way traffic. Yes, yes, yes. Right. yes that's right. Of course. And we get all excited every time we change it, so we just change it every 50 years. And we were, a lot of it worries more about parking and two-way traffic than anything else. Except the coronavirus. <laughs> uh, let's see, because not to mention we had elm trees, huh? Silver Street, where we are, very close to where we are. Um, three story mansions, long gas lit streets, uh, two of those named silver and gold to reflect the wealth of their owners. Then along the riverbank we have the Wyandotte. That was the newest mill at the time. Uh, opened in 1909. Wyandotte Worcester became Riverview Worcester. became Wyandotte after. There's Riverview there and Wyandotte later. Uh, the ironworks Ironworks a fascinating place to see, and we're going to talk about inventions, but uh, in those days of the Industrial Revolution, the, while the process of making fabric or making paper was similar everywhere, the machinery tended to be unique, uh, made, made for the purpose of this mill, made by this mill, so that you couldn't even call F.W. Webb and get a new here you had to have the ironworks make it for you and they did a thriving business for more than a hundred years making machinery and making gears and making steel and iron parts for the mills. Um, so the ironworks started in 1833. I'm going to get to inventions in a minute. Hathaway Shirt Factory in business in 1837 was on Apple. Thank you. 
ago that we, uh, there were really hundreds of inventions simply because of the mills. So if you were working in a mill and you were working on a machine and you found a way to make it work better, you told your boss or you made it yourself or you figured it out, most of those times, in most instances, those uh, patents were subsumed by the company where you worked. Uh, but there were there were exceptions. Uh, Gideon Pichet was the grandfather of John. If John is here, no. Um, he was a, a portrait uh, photographer with, with a studio on Main Street uh, down there where the hotel is across the street. The, uh, he was a Canadian American. He was a tinkerer. He was a genius, really. He had a number of inventions, including, what did he have? A steam furnace control. There it is. That's his patent. What is it? Number 1,011,000. I have no idea what it does. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that, I assume that it, it, it was subsumed by later inventions. It's not one of these things that we recognize today. That's the kind of work he did. Um, what's, what's interesting to me is that in 1910, the Waterloo Police Department had just put in call boxes in, in neighborhoods around town, <clears throat> including down Water Street, and uh, they, were, they, were, they were able to push a button to, to disconnect a circuit to set an alarm in, in City Hall to, to say that they needed help, but there was a fire, so they couldn't talk and just get a signal. Uh, uh, Gideon Pichet went out from his house and shimmied the telephone pole and, and tapped in uh, three lines onto that call box and, and connected it to a telephone. And, and so it was really the first instance of having uh, call boxes, which were actually call boxes. They were no longer signal boxes. Because the, the officer could pick up and talk on the phone. And so Waterloo adapted those everywhere, but Mr. Pichet doesn't get enough credit for that, I don't think. Excuse me, what, day, what year was that? 1910. He climbed the pole on Water Street, tapped one of the wires to the ground of the other, and then created a telephone. So the, the, the signal boxes became call boxes. There are two, as we know, inventors in Waterloo who stand out. Um, Alvin Lombard and Martin Kies, um, their inventions of the caterpillar tread and <clears throat> paper plates and do it to this day. Uh, my investigation into their stories for the Waterville history made me wonder about main inventions writ large. Uh, and when the book was finished, I decided to have a closer look. So the result is another book uh, that's, that's coming out in the fall from Island Port Press, uh, at, which tells the story of 50 uh, remarkable main inventors and the things that they made. It is sure to be a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating story. He was born in, in Spring, Springfield, uh, Maine, Springfield, Maine, Penobscot County. Poor, uh, unschooled, never went to school. At the age of eight, he went to work in his father's sawmill in Lincoln. He learned every bit of, of that business lumberjack, river driver. So uh, um, one time when he was very young, made a miniature sawmill um, and, and set it up on his father's farm in the street. It was just a tiny, he made it just the way he wanted. And to demonstrate it, he sliced pickles. <laughs> <laughs> he would roll the pickles up, cut them, and then slice them into lumber. Yeah. But interestingly enough, 
this man, and I'm going to say he's probably 50 years old there. Uh, he had retired by the time he was 43 and moved to Waterville. He, uh, because, it, because of the success of his previous inventions, which we don't often hear about, he developed a wood-powered, a water-powered wood splitter, uh, a rosser, which is a, which is a debox pulpwood, a debarker. They still use the same principle for debarking now because of him. And then he devised uh, a, 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 a equipment that would remove the knots and sawdust from pulpwood so that it could be used for making paper. <coughs> so he was on a streetcar in the summer of 1899 from Fairfield, headed for his home in Waterville, his new mansion home in Waterville, which is across from the public library. His seatmate was E.J. Lawrence uh, of the firm called Lawrence Newell and Page, headquartered in Fairfield, which became Great Northern Paper Company. Um, see, by the turn of the century, um, Maine's harvesting practices had left thousands of acres of valuable maple, birch, beech, ash uh, in, in the woods because the, the, the heavy pine had been taken out. The pine would float. These hardwoods would not. And they needed to touch them out of the woods somehow and because they had been using uh, oxen first for the heavy pine and then horses. Uh, Lawrence, in this conversation with Lombard on the streetcar in the summer, Bemoaned the cost of that and the cruelty to the horses because they put down horses all the time because they kept getting injured. So they were just using massive numbers of these wonderful beasts to get their wood out. He wanted to do it, see if we could do something better, do it mechanically. And Lombard went home in a little workshop, which I think is still, you could still find it in the basement of that. Uh, and carved out of wood a replica of what he thought he could build, which was a steam, a steam lock hauler, and took it to Lawrence. And Lawrence said, let's do it. And they went to the Water Lion Works and made the first one. And of course, it was a huge success. Um, the, the, I, I think May 4, uh, 1901, which is about the time we're talking about when we set the scene in Waterville, patent number 674737, Lombard, log hauler. Steam powered, uh, upright boiler drove the engines, bobsled in the front, geared to steer, and driven by a continuous belt of hinged steel bags, treads, fit over two pairs of geared wheels, and allowed the machine to pull itself along. Uh, and it worked so well that the orders poured in. He built his first gasoline engine in 1917. So the first ones were steam. They, the, the gas engines were never as powerful as the steam engines. And so uh, the, the woods people preferred the steam because it was stronger. Uh, he made a diesel hauler in 1934, um, and it was the last machine he made. Well, there were 83 of, of them in total, including one we have here. Uh, you know, the caterpillar tread is what was left from this that was so ubiquitous. Uh, tractors, of course, uh, late in World War I and throughout World War II, tanks. Uh, modern snowmobile was nothing more than a Lombard block hauler that's been reduced. It's the same principle for driving snowmobile. Uh, and of course, Lombard's invention encouraged a water man, O.C. Johnson, uh, to build one of the world's first snowmobiles here in 1909, uh, Polaris.
Cyrus is the one that established the uh, in any event. And I, as a child, remember people in town building their own snowmobiles. Dr. John John had one in my house calls. But, um, <laughs> so there's Martin Cyrus. That is arguably the most important invention ever to come out of the state of Maine. And as you think about others, I want to tell you about it. Ones that you can think of yourself, you tell me what was more important than that right, right there. Incredible. That's Martin Kaiser. Isn't he a stiff little? <laughs> Quite different from uh, Alvin Lombard, uh, who was sort of blue-collar guy, uh, and Martin Kais was fastidious to the point of annoyance. <laughs> <laughs> he kept a diary every day of his life, which actually saved, turned out to save his fortune. He was born in New Hampshire, and we claim him anyway, worked on his father's sawmill, made sleighs and carriages. <clears throat> They say that he was working in Upper New York State and when he saw men eating lunch using veneer slices of birch. Um, and they tried it and they split, it didn't work. Moved to North Gorham, the North Gorham Fiber Company, experimented with wood pulp. In 1902, he built this, which is still in the lobby. Kaiser, well, you can't get in to see it without permission from God. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. I mean, really. Rube Goldberg hadn't started doing things, but, but uh, that looks very Rube Goldberg. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Thank you, number two. When he applied for a patent, he found that a co-worker had stolen it, and, and he had to sue him and went to court. And his di diary was so carefully kept that the, the court was convinced, of course, Martin Kaiser had, had, had been the one who actually did this work. So they awarded it. Saved, it saved him. On the other hand, the competition was so bad and so quick that he couldn't make much money, and he had rented a place in Charmin, part of a mill, and they were going to close up on him, because he, he was making, with several of those, he was making 50,000 plates a day, not very many. <coughs> but, yeah, he, but he closed his shop for several months, and then he reopened, and his business was saved by uh, the San Francisco Fire. 1906, when the uh, they ordered the several carloads of paper plates to feed the uh, victims of that, of that tragedy. Uh, so he moved to Waterville next to Lombard, the, the building that we're familiar with today. He died in 1917. Son, son-in-law George Averill, of course, is
invented the square bottom paper bag in 1870. By the time she died, she held a hundred pounds. Can you imagine? Uh, it, it was it was a this was a boom. Yeah. Who would have thought? Put a square bottom on a paper bag, you could actually set it on the counter. Yeah. <laughs> Helen Blanchard of Portland. Not that it? She had 28 inventions in her lifetime, most of them associated with factory sewing, and her most enduring invention was a machine that made the zigzag stitch for buttonholes. Helen Blanche, neat, neat and interesting. Uh, not surprisingly, like Kaiser and Lombard, many of Maine's inventors made improvements in the forest industry. Uh, William, I'm going way back now, William Kendall was the son of a Revolutionary War General, William Kendall's Mills, which was, which was later named Fairfield. Uh, he, he did not invent the circular saw, uh, but he built the first one that anybody had ever seen around these parts. He took a, a six-foot disc of boilerplate and riveted teeth on it and took it down to the Tyconic Dam here in Waterville. Uh, and it would cut lumber four times faster than the reciprocal saws that were going up and down. Um, he, it was so successful that he charged people to come and watch it work. <laughs> 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 that same year, uh, James Emerson of Norwich Walk uh, built a circular saw and a bandsaw with removable teeth. Figure out a way to quickly sharpen uh, not without ruining the main blade. Uh, that's the Peavy. In spring of 1858, Joseph Peavy. Stillwater River watched rivermen using cant dogs to break up a log jam. Uh, they had swiveling cans on them, they had swiveling dogs on them. They couldn't get a grip on the logs. He went home and simplest invention you can imagine, but he he made a pole with a spike at the top and secure the dog so it could move up and down, but not sideways. And Woodsman loved it. And the PV, of course, is still being made and used. Uh, that's, from the, that's from the monument to him, Mount Hope Cemetery in Bangor. Uh, now, let me say that Charles Foster did not invent the toothpick. Everybody says we invented the toothpick. We didn't. It's not true. It's not true. Uh, caveman had <laughs> Caesar had a gold toothpick at the fork. He did not invent it. What did he, and he didn't even invent the machine that made them. What he did was found somebody who would take an adapter machine that would make toothpicks. He did this all just because he had been to Brazil and he'd seen how people's teeth were clean, and he thought that if, if, if he could make toothpicks profitably, he could make a fortune, which he eventually did. But he forgot some basic rules along the way. One was the law of supply and demand. He purchased a there they are. Oh, there we have them. See the toothpicks? Oh, <laughs> Supply and demand. He had millions of toothpicks and not a customer. Uh, first of all, main people were not accustomed to buying toothpicks. I'd say you go to the wood pile and you cut one off. And <laughs> so they, they were not interested. He went to Boston and hired Harvard, MIT students to go to the local restaurants in Boston. On the way out, ask for a toothpick. They didn't know what 
Al die jongens klappen. They explained what they wanted was a toothpick. It was one of these marvelous things. <laughs> and then he would send the salesman back three or four days later and say, would you like to buy something? I was right. He sold millions of them because it became a fad. And often, if you see in that period, you, you will see the illustrations in the artwork and the lithographs, men and women have got toothpicks in their mouth, <laughs> simply because of his marketing. So, of course, we know what happened with Foster. Uh, let's look at, let's go back. So, we're all, what happened to Foster? Uh -huh. What happened to him? He made, he, he made, he found it to Maine and became the toothpick capital of the world. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Wasn't there, there was a toothpick factory in Oakland? Mm -hmm. Yes, there was. The toothpick, it was called my grandfather worked there. Uh, Is that connected? Yeah. yeah. There was Foster. Well, that was called Burris Foster Dixfield. Foster is Foster. Okay, now people like to think that Cyrus McCormick invented the Reaper, the Grain Reaper. In point of fact, the first American patent for the Reaper was, for, was to Obed Hussey of Hull on the last day of 1833 he filed a patent for this machine and it went it was published in the agricultural magazines and journal of the time and Cyrus McCormick saw it and said ah, I did that before you were and I had patented blah 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 uh, so they, they began what was called the Great Reaper War. It went on for years. Who had, who had the rights to that? Is it they both they both made machines. They both appeared at county fairs everywhere, demonstrating whatever they had. There's a whole story that you'll have to read about in my book because it's too to miss. It was 23 years before Hussey sold out to. dollars because McCormick had so on. McCormick was not a nice man. Um, the year after Hussey made his Reaper in 1833, Hiram and John Pitts of Winthrop invented Thresher. And in 1878, a South Paris man, William Deering, built and patented a harvester, which we now call the Combine. Maine had a key role to play in all of that because you see, there were no longer small farms. They, they tended to grow, and they had to grow. You had to find a way to harvest your crop, particularly out west, which is why McCormick was so successful. Because he didn't start until Ohio, he just went west and with vast fields of grain out there that he could sell his harvesters much easier than they could be sold around here in the rocky fields of Maine. Oh, here's another one. <coughs> this is water. This is not a picture. Down at Cross, 1834, Reedfield. He, he invented the first commercial diving suit. And tested it. I, I, I've been in touch with the Historical Society of Dixfield. Nobody remembers or can find the name of the guy who was brave enough to go in the war. It's only fun to pay tribute to him because he was literally taking his life in his hand. Uh, uh, Goodyear had made, by that time, uh, Indian rubber, which, by the way, if you ever remember having Indian rubber, are you not, you're not as old as I am, uh, it stunk. It absolutely stunk because it rotted quickly. They finally figured out a way to save it. So the guy up there was um, with pillows, pumping air, and he had lead shot in his boots so he so he, so he could stand up. Oh, yeah. 
He was so proud of that invention that he named his son Submarinus. <laughs> Imagine what he named Submarinus. <laughs> Another main inventor that sort of shook up the world was Charles Emery of Portland, who figured out how to solder the tops of tin cans and revolutionize the siding industry. Uh, uh, thanks to thanks to Emery, uh, it, 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 forty siding. Uh, medical field. Let's talk about the medical field.
Anyway, I could go on. Uh, it, he grew up in. His father was a nut. His father. Well, I shouldn't say that. His father was a millwright who believed that Price was not only coming back, but they know exactly when he was coming back. It was going to be August 4, 18. And so they got all ready. Now his mother said, that's not sure. I'm not dressing up. Jesus is not coming back. And of course, sure enough, the day comes and Jesus doesn't arrive. And Jesus just fails to show up all together. And they ran the pastor and Hiram's father out of town. Because they were so disappointed. Oh, that's it. That's your interchangeable rifle. That's the, that's the hall rifle. It'd be a treasure if you had one. And that's higher maximum with his machine gun. He was 60 years old. He had already invented tons of stuff. He, he was just, he, he, he moved to England. He was knighted by the Queen. Oh, the Queen died before she could. Transportation, trying to make some sense of all this in some kinds of ways. Farmington Falls native Leonard Atwood uh, left the Union Army and moved to New York where he built the first petroleum pipeline in the world. That's not him. He also designed the first vertical railway. Listen to this. And so his invention to a man named Elisha Otis. <laughs> Amazing. The Stanleys. That's the Stanley brothers. Kingfield twins. Francis and Freeland Stanley. They actually had invented before this dry plate photography for their sister, who was really a exquisite photographer. And I met much of her work. Some of it is on, uh, Col Colby had some of it. It's, it's around the state. Pretty well, Shanson, other Stanley Evans. Uh, pictures of life in, in, the, in, the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, just ordinary farm pictures. They're just wonderful. Um, so, and they went on to build the Stanley Steamer uh, not in Maine, but from Maine. Uh, they were the first to sell automobiles. Stanley was the first commercially sold automobile. But in 1908, uh, Henry Ford began making Model Ts on an assembly line. So 19, by 1917, Ford was making 735,000 cars a year, two Lizzie's. Stanley Brothers were working flat out to build 500 families at a factory in Newton, Massachusetts. The Fords cost about 500 bucks a piece, and the Stanleys were about $4,000. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> It was the end of what they <laughs> called the time to fly into blood. <laughs> okay, let's move into the sky. Charles Lampson of Augusta, watchmaker who dabbled in kites. I mean, these were not children's kites. Oh. <laughs> they could carry, they could carry a man into the air, as you see. Uh, in in uh, 1896, he took one of those rigs to Portland. There are thousands of people who came out to watch it work. Uh, he put a bag of sand in place of a man, wisely. <laughs> <laughs> when he got 600 feet in the air, the rope broke. Oh. Um, <laughs> but he never gave up and would fly in his own kites. Um, the Wright brothers
brothers bought one to test the Kitty Hawk before they built a plane of their own. Main man, Charles Lamson, Augusta. <coughs> then let's get into the stuff that people don't laugh about and can't be sure is true. Uh, See, he's holding a donut. That's Hanson Gregory, the ship captain out of Rockport. He liked donuts. <laughs> donuts had come from Denmark originally, and Gregory was a Dane. Uh, the story goes that he was at sea and encountered a bad storm. And he squashed the donut. It was solid. Down onto the spokes of the wheel oh. so we could manage the ship. Right, things and went back to his donut and a hole in it. They didn't like the center of those donuts anyway because you couldn't cook them right instead of the donut. But that's the story. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't believe it, don't tell anybody in Rockport because they sure do down there. <laughs> Chewing gum. John Curtis from Bradford. You like the raw spruce gum. You tried it? Yeah. Holy <laughs> scum. Well, your teeth <laughs> he filled a kettle with spruce gum, maple syrup, sugar, boiled it on the kitchen stove, poured it onto a sheet, let it harden, sliced it, and bingo. Chewing gum. Wow. <laughs> they made a fortune. That company made a fortune. They ended up owning the Portland Steamship Line. <laughs> Yeah, I did. How about Moxie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yummy. <laughs> Augustus Thompson was a physician in the Union Army and served with a man named Clyde Moxie. Later, when Thompson moved to establish a practice in Union, Maine, Moxie paid him a visit and brought with him a concoction he claimed give the body power. <laughs> Thompson tried some and agreed. In 1855, he began packaging Moxie nerve food, a patent medicine long before there was Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> and it was made from the root of gentian. He later made it into a drink. That's not an early advertisement. The early one said it would cure a range of afflictions, including loss of manhood, <laughs> paralysis, and softening of the brain. One drink you can do all And then there was Milton Bradley, born in Vienna, moved away from Maine, but in 1860, he made the board game called The Game of Life. Sold 45,000 copies a year and went on to become a leader in the board game industry. Chester Greenwood <laughs> had big ears. <laughs> you can't see them here, but he did have big ears. I've checked. Uh, and his grandmother made a piece of spring wire and so on tufts of fur to keep his ears warm. And you know that story. He, he, uh, he kept the town of Farmington going. And they still celebrate every winter. John Poland of Lovell. Between 1884 and 1886, invented a centrifugal ringer, a reverse spin mechanism, and a mangle ringer to lead the way on the first home electric washing machine. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> Greenwood, Maine. Made the first book in 1910. Became the basis of the largest catalog company in the world. 
Okay, now who knows what this is? <coughs> Combination square. Combination square, the Sterrett square. Yeah. Made by a man named Leroy Sterrett, a carpenter, China man. Sliding head. Essentially unchanged. Everybody has one. Everybody has one. This public one. What year was that? Uh, 1879. That's an early one, but not the earliest. It's quite remarkable. Uh, Frank Butler Gilbreth of Fairfield uh, became a general contractor. Some of us will remember the Gilbreth company. Invented a number of building tools and machines, including a safety scaffold for bricklayers, conveyors, uh, an improved concrete mixer. <coughs> uh, he was the one who formulated the first cost plus fixed sum contract. Uh, the Gilberts, large family, 12 children in the 50s, were immortalized by the Hollywood film Chief of the Dazzle. Now, the world then moved, as you know, to the age of communication and, and electronics. The main people were in the lead on many of those ventures. Joseph Stern of Weld invented the duplex, <coughs> invented duplex telegraphy in 1868. <coughs> he went on to lay miles of telegraphic cables in countries around the world. Joseph Stern, George Grant of Farmingdale. That is, my friends, a calculator. <laughs> That's the same calculator you buy at Rite Aid for two bucks, <laughs> except that won't do as much as the one that you buy, <laughs> because it doesn't carry the numbers out as far. The, uh, I, I, most people realize that uh, Charles Babbage is credited with developing the calculator. But in fact, he could never build one because he didn't know how to make the precise gears that were necessary. So Babbage never built this calculator. It was a main boy, George Grant of Farmingdale, <coughs> the first full scale calculator in 1868. How big was that? And that's in the Smithsonian. Have 15,000 parts. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. It weighed a ton. How, how, large, how large is that? That's about eight feet tall. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Wow. <laughs> Did they use it? It's not a desktop. Yes. It, it actually worked. I don't know how long it was for. He made smaller versions and sold them and made some money doing that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Wellington Kidder of Norwich Walk invented the offset press, which is quite a revolutionary development in the printing world. <coughs> uh, now, we have a fellow named Henry Beveridge of North Haven. We have relatives in the audience. <laughs> he was a 19 year old student at the University of Maine in April of 1912 when he intercepted uh, distress signals from the Titanic. And it, and it turned his, his life's interest to, to that sort of thing. One, one of these great products of the University of Maine Engineering School, I mean, there's, there's dozens of them, what they contributed is <coughs> He went to work for General Electric <coughs> when he invented the wave antenna. It was a giant leap at the time. Communication. It made it possible to receive uh, short wave messages, sort them out, and relay them over landlines. You can imagine the defensive war, how important that development was. And that's his own sketch, hmm. which somebody has, has adapted. I don't believe that's his, I believe his own, it's from his own sketch. 
just say how simple it was, what he had done to Wavelength. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Uh, did you want to stand up? Uh, well, no. <laughs> but, but the University of Maine does recognize him in their alumni house as one of its distinguished graduates. Yeah. Uh, as a moment, by the way, the first voting machine was, was developed by another University of Maine electrical engineer, Neville Hopkins. First electronic voting machine in 1920. This guy, person Spencer Howland, was a leader in the development design of radar tubes. He was building magnetrons in his MIT lab in 1945 when he noticed the candy bars in his pocket were melting sometimes. So he experimented in the lab with other food, including popcorn, <laughs> and then filed a patent for the radar range which two years later became the first microwave oven. How we mean. And we just read of the death of Charles Peddle, who was born in Bangor, uh, who is actually the fight went to GE and Motorola and led in the development of a little cost computer chip. Computer chip just made, makes it possible for us to all have our own. Okay, so let me now, I, you, I, you have to pay for this lecture in this way. I have to just lecture just for a minute. Because the impression that I get over and over, and I, as you can tell, I like this, and, I, and I'm glad some of you do too. I hope you all do. But I, 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 we, we don't really do a good job <coughs> recognizing, taking care of, of our past. We really don't. I mean, it's a special fault of Americans, I think, maybe because we are still young. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I know when you go to Europe, you know, they, 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 if, if a building falls down, they put it on a heat and put a plaque on it and tell you what it is and you all stop and read it. But here, you know, we don't do anything like that. We don't. Uh, and so, if we're, gonna, if we're going to protect our past, we have to at least understand it. Let's, let's just play a game of what if. What if we had preserved the Mortar Hall on the old campus? It was the first Civil War building on any college campus in the country. We should have saved it. Yes. And you, many of you went around to help. We had some people who did. It wasn't possible to save it. Wouldn't it have been nice? Wouldn't that have been nice? The great revival post office that stands at the tip of Main Street was once one of the city's most elegant buildings. Handsome limestone, wonderful rotunda, mahogany trim. As wonderful people are inclined to do, they fussed about parking, and the postal service abandoned the place and built a rather inelegant, nondescript, <laughs> horrible building on College Avenue. What if that parking problem had been solved some other way when we could have preserved that building for its original use? Wouldn't that be nice? And the steam engine. In front of it. Huh? And the tree in front of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. The steam engine 470. The largest and the last, the last on the line from Main Central Railroad. A gift to the city from the railroad. What if it had been properly kept? and perhaps move to a spur down near the wonderful new river water. Wouldn't that be? Mm -hmm. Yes. That. The train station itself, there was no need to tear the train station down. It wasn't in the way of anything. It had nothing to do with the river at all. What if it was still there and filled with shops? Wouldn't that be nice? And then the last, we have the Lombard Tractor. Perhaps, as I've said, the most significant invention ever to come out of the state of Maine. We ought to have that tractor 
where we can see it, show it off, where it would stand as an achievement of our great city, and where we could educate our children and their children about Waterville's astonishing past. Let's please move it away from its isolation by the bridge. I don't care what you do, but do something to save it. It wouldn't that be nice. Thank you, I'm done preaching. There's <laughs> a moment for questions if you have any. I'm not guaranteed that I Are you familiar with the Ferris wheel? That no. Invented the name. No, didn't know that. We have, it, it, there's a museum in Poland Springs that talks about it and what they use for the riding it is the size of a bus. Mm -hmm. And they went to a world fair, I don't remember what year or when. Didn't know it. So, Chicago. 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 Chicago.
then uh, Harry Crook of Brunswick, Maine had a steam lombard, and uh, he had collected two or three others over the years, 50 years. And uh, so we purchased a couple from him, and then we picked one up from Strong, Maine, and uh, one up from Augusta, Maine. So we have a total of six, four of them that run. Uh, two of them right now are up in the Bradley Museum on the side of Roar. And they have also a Harry Crooked Schema there, and the uh, one that they restored that took 20 years to restore Steam Lombard. So my brother right now is restoring the Steam Lombard in the 28 foot garage that goes end to end. And, uh, pretty interesting. They've been going to my father and my brothers for 30, 40 years. Went up to the Allagash with a tractor trailer, my uh, bulldozer, skidder, all back parts. So we probably have the most parts around for Lombards. Uh, around. We have the most on bars and we got the most that run. And uh, we do take them to different shows throughout Maine. It's, uh, we have no equipment to haul them, but most people will send a tractor trailer to haul them. And we bring them to uh, Winter Fair or the Fountain Tractor Show and you know I bring the literature and pictures. We have a, just a lot of stuff and uh, you know the people that used to run these machines back in the old days are disappearing off the quick. And uh, you still find People today that their parents or their grandfather worked at the Lombard's factory, and uh, there's a couple of ladies on social school pickups that came out of the mill. And uh, as a uh, you know, uh, man was saying, Lombard made 83 steam Lombards at 216 gas. I made 1917s well, when they went to gas, and they had four cylinders, and they went to six cylinders, and then they had one diesel. And besides that, Lombard invented over 300 different patents on sprinkler systems, to washing machines, to carburetors. One of his big, big uh, invention was a uh, governor for the water dams, so that governor the water going over the dams, so it always saves the speed to power them out. So that was a big uh, thing for him. And you know, I've got, I've got four or five books in the truck. This patent you can't print off enough. The patent might be two pages, one patent might be 29. I start copying them off and it uh, takes a lot of ink in the paper. <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, uh, we're from Bassboro and uh, you know we there's some literature I passed out that uh, tells a bit about some of the stuff and, and uh, the uh, the steam one my brother's doing it'll uh, probably only stay on our property because you have to have the state inspect the boiler. And, uh, and unless if you don't you can use it on your property but if you take it somewhere else. It has to be inspected because they uh, suddenly get struck because it blows up in deep trouble. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, if you ever want to see him, the number of the name, my name is Rick, and I've got the smallest one of all of them. And uh, we have two that are only, there's about 20 lumbides left, and two of them we have are only one of each. And I have one of them's the small one, used to sit on the guest order by Wang Simpson, on the right by the ice cream store. Father got that for me and passed away before I finished restoring it. But, uh, so it was up to my father that you know we got all this stuff and uh, we got some full bonds that they're in. And, um, I guess they tooled up in Brewer right now. And I don't like them up there because we're in the wood building with two other lumbars. Kids today put the two miles off the woods and light a match and everything's gone. So that's not a I don't have them up there. They're not mine and my brothers, so I have mine. Mine's in my next garage. <laughs> <laughs> I keep a full sight of my stuff. Uh, that's all I really got to say, but Lombard uh, did a bit of a lot of different stuff. And, uh, wherever you take these Lombards and they're running, they draw a big crowd and they like to, people like to see them move. Yeah. 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 I do need the Lombard dam down there. I am. I'm just a mile from it. Yes. You what? I was about a mile from the dam. I see. And, uh, now, but aren't they going to take that apart? They took, the dam, they took the dam apart, three parts of the dam they took apart, and then the rest of the dam was a little cubicle, and then they had Lombard had a governor that he had made for a water thing. And I just, two years ago, I got in there, it's a classmate of mine owns the building, and uh, it's still all got to pull these flat belts, the, the pillars down below, but it hasn't been used in 50 years, and it's not original Lombard governor, it's another brand, but must have took out at one time and replaced it, but it's, uh, it's still all there and the water's going around the dam. Yeah, well, Paul Schiller worked for Kai Sparber, mm -hmm. and he bought that big old home there. Oh, yeah. And he had a big 
and he restored the dam. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's not much of a dam now. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he went back. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I went to the Clinton Fair one time with two of the Lombards, and this man came up, and I got album, you know, people like to get to the album. And uh, this man said, so I worked at Kai Fiber in 1965, and he took down one of the Lombard buildings up there. And he walked it, and on the mantle right here was a Lombard steam pressure gauge for a Lombard. Uh, so we've been looking for one for years. <laughs> I brought, we got two big steam boilers sitting on my brother's back lawn for the steamers, and you know, they weigh 10,000 pounds. I said, man, you want to get rid of that? You know, I'm trying to make a deal with this guy. <laughs> I said, and anyways, uh, you want to sell it? So he went home and he was there with a friend that I knew, and he's a 70 year old man. And uh, so my buddy that knew him says, you know, something happens to you, your kids will not do nothing with just the age. So they're, they're just good. So this guy goes home, and I didn't know this was going on, and I got the table and it was tent, and this guy drives in and parks right in front of the table where, like, where people would be sitting. I said, what's going on here? You know? and this guy comes up, he has this human behind his back, and he gave me the slump box. Oh. <laughs> so I was in my kitchen cabinet, up, up hidden, you know. So I get home, I call my younger brother, Paul, he's the steam of Steve Lombard. He says, Paul, guess what I got in my hand? I said, well, I just got a Steve Lombard pressure gauge. Oh my God. So he called every time I call him, he said, when are you bringing it down to my house? You know? said, uh, when you get the Lombard, then we'll, I'll keep it for now, you know. But uh, we did get a lot of help from the railroad and people uh, making parts of these Lombards, you know. They'd, we used to take the big green on the front page and take it to a uh, push fair pulling the drags. People would love to see that pull the drags and then win the fair. It would pull everything right out. They would be pissed off at us pulling it out, you know. And, but you know, we, the last time I pulled it, the front wheels never touched the ground for 300 feet. <laughs> we pulled it out, but you know, for pot breaks, it's going to be 10 years restoring that machine to get it back. Home. So we don't pull it anymore. But, uh, it, it does look good and it's a big machine, nine times. And it's probably one of the best weapons we have. Stop truck one. And my brother like, went up last fall uh, up to the Yellow Gas with my nephew, and they took his track to the 24 foot trailer. And they went and got two tracks for a sea lumbar that weighed maybe 5,000 pounds, both of them. And they had been taken apart, and they were stretched out 20 feet, frozen for 100 years. So we dragged them on the trailer with a water tank that goes on top. They brought them home, so last summer I drive by with this four, I suppose we all were close by. I go by and I can see them up there pounding, so I'm trying to ride the dry pit until they're 20 inches long. <laughs> so I stopped and got a little So anyways, he's got a 12 pound sledge and I'm holding a big nut with this thing and we have a big long bolt and I'm going through the nut to hit this thing. And the pin and anyways, every time you hit that thing, the nut and the bolt would go flying up to feet. You know, it took more time to run and get the parts pull these pins and you pull the pins through so far and they were at a wedge you have to cut them and then pound them back and pull them back. So he took he did that the whole summer to get his tracks apart. So now they're all apart, they sandblasted and painted, um, got all new pins and uh, you know you walk in this garage and the, the big drive trains from the steam pistons on the side that went to the back track when uh, the museum up in Bango was stored there. Uh, they got a set of new chains that drive the four inch lanes like the bicycle chain, but four inch diameter the lane. So uh, I asked him for the name of the company and I called him and he said, uh, one guy answered, I remember that 25 years ago, 20 years ago doing that. I said, well, we'd like to have a set of chains like that for this one we're restoring. And about two weeks later, they called me back and said, well, what do you want us to ship them? I said, hold it for you, ship them. I want to know what the cost is. <laughs> These are the big chains. And yeah. Anyway, they, said they sent them no charge. And, Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, so it is. And uh, right now, the set of gears being made in Wisconsin to drive the universal gear in. It's a flat plate, and it's four gears made in a tri triangle like this. And they're all around this plate, four of them. And then the power comes and it turns one track or the other. You just can imagine how you can even make this gear. I was looking at this book and all the. So we took a gear off and sent it to a company and they're going to make four for us and they'll get us a drive for that one month. But, uh, anyway, they're, they're really amazing machines. They had a lot of power. And uh, anyway, that's uh, 